Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about planets that are Earth-like or even more Earth-like. In other words, more perfect for life to develop and to live. We'll discuss a new interesting idea that was recently presented in Spain and at the same time we'll talk about what it means for the future of discoveries of different exoplanets. So let's talk about this in more detail and welcome to What The Math. So when it comes to defining a perfect Earth-like planet, today most astronomers consider a few things. Like for example, in order for us to have liquid water, the planet has to be in the right location around the parent star and we refer to this as the habitable zone. You can see the Earth is actually right here in this orbit in the habitable zone of um, the solar system. We also believe the atmosphere plays a huge role and of course other uh, things like for example the types of molecules in the atmosphere, the types of molecules on the surface and so on and so forth. But we never really talk much about the actual oceans themselves, specifically the interaction of oceans and the currents of oceans. And this is where this particular study or this particular um, presentation comes in that was recently delivered by a scientist from University of Chicago, Stephanie Olson, who talked about uh, the exo-oceanography, in other words, studying the oceans of exoplanets, which she believes is really important in trying to discover well, not just planets that can potentially support life and be very Earth-like, but possibly even planets that are better than Earth. Much better than our own planet in not just supporting life, but also evolving life and um, creating all sorts of diversity. Well, so first of all, um, oceans on our planet are exceptionally important. We, we really don't give them enough credit. So an example of how ocean um, protects our planet and the life on our planet is right here. We know that there were several cases in history um, where Earth turned into what's known as an ice ball planet. I'm doing this right now using the Universe Sandbox. I basically removed all the carbon dioxide to make our planet freeze. Now, once this happens, uh, unfortunately for our planet, it's going to be really hard for it to recover. And so the only way for us to really protect life on the planet is going to be oceans. And this is exactly how life on our planet survived. It stayed in the oceans um, underneath the ice until one day the planet started to thaw slowly and eventually all of the ice retreated and we basically uh, got the planet that we have today. Okay, it's not really that hot, but it looks very similar to what you see on the screen. The world oceans also provide all sorts of currents that can distribute necessary nutrients and necessary minerals across the planet to regions where they wouldn't really exist. But at the same time, they have a very important feature that's not really studied well in school or really talked about much. And here I'm talking about a concept known as upwelling. This technically deserves its own video because there are a lot of really complicated things happening here. But in a nutshell, because of the action of the winds and because of the general motion of the water, the warmer surface water moves offshore, it moves away from the shore here, and this empty space is then filled in by deeper, colder, nutrient-rich water. In other words, this uh, very rich in nutrients water moves to the surface where it then provides all sorts of nutrients, food, and all sorts of uh, needed components for life to sustain itself and to flourish. And this vertical motion is constantly happening in our oceans and allows life on our planet to not just survive, but to thrive. It's an essential component of life on Earth, and without this motion, basically nothing would exist. The oceans on our planet are so efficient at circulating these nutrients that not only have they kick-started life, but they've supported life for billions of years and they made it survive through some really, really challenging and cataclysmic events, including multiple collisions with asteroids that uh, destroyed certain life, but other life survived and flourished again. So the oceans on our planet provide a very essential climate control and stability that's needed for life to sustain itself and to always, always come back stronger and better. And also, interestingly, the atmosphere of our planet, including, of course, the atmospheric conditions and weather and climate in general, are directly influenced by oceans of our planet. 
Not so much the other way around. The atmosphere doesn't really influence ocean as much as ocean influences the atmosphere. And here using this projection um, on earth.nullschool.net, we can even see the oceanic currents and all sorts of other information, like for example the global currents that you can see and how they circulate everything around the planet. So this is a pretty cool simulation to learn a little bit more about oceans and how all of this works on the beautiful planet Earth. But anyway, we're getting a little bit sidetracked. We've talked about the importance of oceans and why they're so uh, beneficial and so crucial to life on Earth. But what does all of this have to do with exoplanets? Well, according to the scientists behind the study, it just so happens that if you were to simulate similar conditions to what we have on Earth using, like for example, the very rigorous NASA simulation known as Rocky 3D, um, you can technically generate all sorts of interesting planetary conditions. Like for example here we can even generate Earth um, if it had four times more CO2 as um, compared to what it has right now. And here's kind of what Earth would look like. Pretty pretty hot. But anyway, so this uh, is a very, very accurate simulation and technically an extremely powerful tool, but they use this tool a little bit differently. What they did is they simulated conditions with a regular Earth as a baseline, where they tried to improve certain things to see if they can make Earth even better. Or in other words, what would we have to change? Like for example, maybe size of continents or rotation speed on the planet in order for us to make an even better Earth or an even better planet for life support. And all of this was based on how oceans interact with life. So in other words, they try to um, create the ultimate, I guess you could call it Gaia. This ultimate ideal and perfect world even better than planet Earth. Well, after simulating various planets and changing various parameters of those planets, First discovery was that it turns out if the planet was moving a little bit slower, in other words, if the day cycle of this planet we're going to be calling Gaia was slower than planet Earth, it would have higher and better conditions for oceans to um, be able to exchange those nutrients. So here we're going to change the rotation of this planet to let's say maybe three days just for the sakes of the simulation. So it already spins slower than Earth and has much longer days. At the same time, it's very important for these planets to have at least some continents. So just an ocean planet is not a good place. All of the planets they've simulated that had continents were much better at supporting life. And so here, even though we have a lot of water, we still have large enough islands and different continents for um, basically increasing the motion of these nutrients and to stimulate this so-called upwelling that is essential for nutrients to circulate around the planet. Another important parameter was the atmospheric density, and here increasing the density of the atmosphere would also increase chances for it being more Gaia-like, even better than Earth. So we're going to give this planet a um, similar atmosphere to Titan, the moon of Saturn. It's going to be about 50% stronger than the atmosphere of Earth. And by changing these uh, very few parameters, we have now given the oceans on this planet an ability to exchange oxygen and methane with a lot more effectiveness. And at the same time, all of this will encourage the nutrient exchange across the whole planet, increasing the chance for life to not just survive, but become really advanced and also become extremely successful, even possibly more successful than on Earth. Now it seems that not all parameters mattered, like for example, I believe the, um, the actual size and mass of the planet was not as important, the gravity was not as important, also the level of salinity of the oceans was not really as crucial. Most importantly, the orbit and the location of the planet was not as essential either. And all of this suggests that we might be able to find a lot of these exoplanets out there. By having a study like this and by establishing really important guidelines for what makes a really good Earth-like or even better than Earth-like planet, we'll be able to now um, search for specific exoplanets instead of searching for everything. And with further analysis, we'll be able to establish really specific guides on, like for example, how fast should the planet spin for us to consider it to be a really good candidate. Like for example, if a rotation of about 13 days is what we're looking for, we'll be able to find many of these different um, exoplanets around red dwarfs and 
with a rotation of 13 days, these planets will usually be in a very hospitable, habitable zone where an ocean can exist and possibly create these conditions needed for life. But what's really unusual about this study is that for the first time uh, scientifically, we were able to actually show that, well, it seems that Earth is not as perfect even for um, creatures that live on the planet compared to potentially other planets we might discover out there that could support life even better. And this is really important because it will definitely encourage us to keep looking, to keep analyzing and to keep discovering various other objects that might one day not just maybe replace our planet, but add to it and allow us to move to new areas, new worlds and new locations where we'll have really, really comfortable lives. In other words, you know how if you're in US or Canada, you know that most people retire and move to Florida or Hawaii or someplace warm. Well, maybe in the future, in about 100 to 200 years, we'll be retiring on these unusual Gaia planets somewhere out there in the galaxy. Planets very similar to the one I just created that are better than Earth in every single way. But anyway, until follow-up studies or until we discover more of these exoplanets that could potentially support life even better than Earth, that's really all I wanted to mention in this video. We're going to come back and talk more about this topic in some of the future videos because it is absolutely fascinating and it's definitely something I would like to explore more. Anyway, on that note, come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe even consider supporting this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.